Hello YouTube, it's William here with Cobra Coppers Trains, and today we're going to try something new. We're doing the $20 train show challenge. So I'm heading out to my local train show with only $20 in my pocket, and we're going to see what we can find. The train show we're going to be attending today is the Tri-City Train Show. It takes place at the Roma Lodge on the first or second Sunday of every month, depending. And uh, this was actually shot quite a few days uh, prior. This show actually happened on February 13th, but I'm just now getting around to editing the footage. A couple ground rules as we're walking into the show is I'm limiting myself to only HO scale purchases, and I'm buying as many items as I can fit under that $20 hat. Something to note is that I did have my card with me in case I ran into anything rare, unusual, or something that I desperately needed to have that would have been above that $20 limit. So with $20 in my pocket and my admission paid and ready to go, let's see what we can find. I think you guys will be surprised. And we're starting right out of the gate with the first booth to the left of the entrance. This guy had some assorted HO rolling stock and engines at not unreasonable prices, just nothing particularly interesting. The next booth down had a great selection of Lionel and O-Gage, but unfortunately their prices were rather high. Uh, as you'll see in just a minute, this Riverossi 4 car set is at $75. Those 20th century limited passenger cars were a little bit tempting, but we've barely gotten started and we gotta keep going. The rest of his booth was entirely filled with all this boxed Lionel stuff and not particularly interesting, even if it were inside the scope of the challenge. This next booth had quite a selection of flyer, as well as a lot of figurines and other detail parts and such. There were a few HO pieces scattered here and there, but it was mostly random and assorted rolling stock, so I didn't spend too much time looking around. That being said, if you needed some detail parts, scenery, or figurines, this would have been a good place to stop. Now immediately to the right and behind that booth, uh, there was a booth featuring predominantly O-Gage, but they also had some very cool paper bits and bobs here, if that's your sort of thing. But to the right of that, there was the main attraction. They had lots of post-war accessories, uh, pre-war and post-war O-Gage further down the table, which I found particularly interesting. Uh, did stop to take a brief look at these bullet engines. Um, obviously not part of the challenge, but it is always nice to see those. Uh, in any case, though, the rest of this booth did not really apply to me or the challenge, so we're just going to be moving right along. Uh, the same thing can be said for the booth directly adjacent to it. Uh, they just had a somewhat disappointing selection of some straight track and a couple pieces of rolling stock. Coming up in just a second, you're about to see me step into the main show of the room, which is where you're going to get a sense of scale for just how big, or small rather, this show really is. You can't say that I didn't warn you and that it's not a large show. In any case, um, I'd sort of arrived a little bit early for the day. I'd gotten my early bird bonus in that I got to see everything as it was being set up. So some of these uh, vendors had not quite finished setting up all of their stock. This guy had uh, some interesting things left over from the last show, including but not limited to this Bachman Rio Grande Diesel. A couple of assorted kits, in my opinion the most noteworthy of which is that green Arbor Models 460 in the back. Um, those are terrifying from what I've heard. Uh, it was being sold rather cheaply though. A butchered Riverossi 080 and a Roundhouse 442 kit. Unfortunately his stock had diminished greatly compared to the previous show and he didn't have a lot of interesting stuff left but it was still cool to see them again. Next booth over had some very nice brass locomotives in addition to a horrendously overpriced end scale set. Uh, like you normally see it does. In any case, uh, there's nothing else for us here, so we're going to be moving right on down. Uh, they also did have this really unusual, uh, what is that, an ON30 set. Uh, the price was quite high, but you know, if that's what you're looking for, they had it. This vendor uh, hadn't finished setting up yet, and I don't think he ever finished setting up at all because these totes full of models were on his table for the entire remainder of the show. Last time he was here, he had a lifelike G5 that had been uh, very heavily customized. It wasn't priced horribly, but uh, with the customizations added, I was not particularly interested. This next booth down... I uh, had quite the assortment of random materials, but on the end they had some high-end brass. And my favorite thing that I didn't buy is right here, this $200 Nickel Plate Products Hiawatha set. 
Uh, these are rather early brass, so they're not particularly yeah, detailed or fancy, but they are very cool, yeah, and they, I feel that they would make a great match a with my Riverossi 442 Class A high so uh, In addition to the other high brass they had here, the prices were quite high, as you would expect we'll with we'll most see. brass models, so unfortunately not applicable yeah. to our challenge. Maybe someday I'll go back for those Hiawatha cars, though. The next booth over had almost exclusively post-war Lionel. Uh, some of it in great condition, some of it in not so great condition, as you'll see in a moment. Next to them was some assorted railroad memorabilia, including signal locks, lanterns, and other such things. This booth also specialized in post-war Lionel, and they had a couple interesting parts chassis that if you were in the market for such a thing, this would be a great place to pick it up, as those were priced very cheaply. Now these outer booths right here are a little boring, and there's not a lot of stuff to look at, and unfortunately that seemed to be the theme for this particular show. I didn't really see a lot of things I was spectacularly interested in. In fact, I was having a difficult time finding things to spend the $20 on. In any case, this is one of my favorite vendors at our local show. His name is Angelo, and he's always got a bunch of great stuff, like this unusual Lionel uh, New Haven Electric. Uh, on the left of that is a Marx set, actually, also in New Haven. He also had his usual excellent selection of boxed rolling stock and motive power. Particularly interesting was this weird streamlined New York Central set. This time his prices were amazing in the wrong way. As always though, he is willing to negotiate, so if there's something you are really interested in, do not hesitate to ask. Continuing down the line, uh, we just have more of the unfortunate same old, same old. Uh, like I said earlier, boring and repetitive kind of seem to be the themes for this particular show. Um, a lot of the vendors either hadn't moved or hadn't rotated out enough of their product, so when it came time for the third show in a row for me, uh, I was just seeing a lot of the same things over and over. This booth had some particularly nice items, including some higher-end Bachman Steam, but the main reason I'm attracted to this stuff here is that they have a lot of Riverossi passenger cars. Here's an Illinois Central set. These are actually the guys that I bought my five-car Empire State Express set from. They have a lot of duplicates left over from that Empire State, though. Uh, these are a bunch of Ruben E. Fenton coaches, which I already have, so I unfortunately have not yet assembled the complete set as they didn't have all the cars that I needed. Next to him was another, of course, Lionel Hoover. And further on down, uh, this vendor had a really nice assortment of rolling stock. Uh, no motive power to speak of this time that I was crazy interested in, but last show he did sell me a plus GS4, basically new in the box, for about 20 axles. He also had another selection of buildings and things. Scenery pieces, this was your available and inexpensive. Back to Angelo's booth, uh, you can see now he's got more just assorted rolling stock in all scales, except for O really, and then underneath are his junk boxes, which is where you will find a lot of other assorted rolling stock and his parts engines. Now this booth of course had the obligatory Jim Beam decanter train that you obviously can't go a single show without seeing. Moving down, this vendor only had one small box of HO scale stuff, which you can see here. The only thing in there that was particularly interesting was the Golden Eagle caboose. Continuing on down the line, they also had the obligatory selection of Lionel pieces, post-war and otherwise. Uh, this one didn't have anything super standout, but moving on to the next booth, I was actually quite tempted by this parts Norfolk and Western J class. However, it was missing a lot of essential components like the entire frame, so I did end up passing on it even though the price wasn't horrendous. Also tempting at this booth was this Tyco Chattanooga 280. Uh, at a relatively low price of about $18, which is not bad. I was very interested in and confused by this CNR Mantua tender. Certainly factory painted because it was rubber stamped onto the tender. Um, there were also a few other miscellaneous parts in there, but that booth was pretty small. Uh, more Lionel stuff that we're going to skip over, and this is one of the largest vendors that we have at this show. He was also present at the Mad City show, if you have seen my recent video on that. Um, there's that same Walther's Hiawatha set. His stuff moves incredibly slowly, so if there's something at this booth that you're interested in, you could probably come back two months from now and he would still be trying to sell it. 
Uh, this CB&Q 060 was also somewhat tempting for the price, but I wanted to see if I could find something a little more interesting than that, or something that I would run more often. They did have an assortment of passenger cars underneath, but they were either not the sets that I was looking for, duplicates, or just not in good shape. Uh, there were no contiguous 8 car sets, and the reason I had to cut there is I was having trouble getting it back into the crate, but I did manage to do so. Now this vendor also has some high-end brass stuff, which, uh, if you watched my Mad City show, this should all look rather familiar to you, especially the price tags on things like that uh, CB and Q Northern up there. But, uh, like I mentioned in the Mad City show, they still have that NKP Hudson, which you're about to see in just a moment, that I've been interested in uh, on and off for quite some time. There's a lot of higher end stuff at this booth, and there's a great mix of other rolling stocks, so it's not a bad place to hang around per se, but they don't tend to move very far on their prices, so if you're a negotiator, this booth is not for you. Stuff is, of course, boxed up, which makes browsing difficult unless you are a fan of reading a ton of box ends. I didn't dig around in here. These guys don't really deal in parts engines. Now we're back underneath Angelo's booth looking through some of the parts trays as I've covered everything else in the show up to this point that I was able to do so. Um, we're just taking a quick look around and grab that auto pulse box from my friend Varun and uh, well the contents are not what you'd expect but if you need some electrical parts there you go. Sorry Varun. In any case, lots of Tyco billboard cars like the Old Dutch Cleanser equipment, and I was looking for some Athern 060s that he had last time, some of the early ones that I could pick up for a friend of mine. Unfortunately, those boxes were not present. I was somewhat interested in this Western Atlantic car, but when I found out that he wanted $5 for it, I decided to pass. Same with that Alco 1000 type switcher in the bottom. Just resetting these boxes so that other guests can look through them in the same order that I did. Um, yeah, so it's fairly standard stuff. Most of his parts trays this time contained this sort of assortment of rolling stock and motive power parts. But there were a few interesting items in his parts bins that we will get to later. Now I just want to go off on a little bit of a tangent here while I've got your attention, but um, I did not manage to get any footage of my least favorite vendor's booth, most mostly because he was pretty crabby this particular day and I didn't really want to test him with filming his booth. This was, in my opinion, the most interesting parts tray that Angelo's booth had. There was a Bachman 484 pancake drive that obviously suffered from shattered axles, a miscellaneous tender, and quite the number of diesel locomotives and associated parts. Uh, as we get just a little bit deeper into this stack, you can see that there's a mix of manufacturers, Lifelike, Athern, AHM. Um, unsure what brand this 040 is, but uh, I mean, you can find these just about anywhere. Looked sort of like uh, Riverossi, but it had an open frame motor, which they never produced. Uh, whatever the heck that was, but there were also quite a few um, other assorted just engine parts. There was a Varney boiler and tender down in there, and uh, yeah, just your usual assortment of parts bin things. Now at this point in the show I'd been walking around for maybe I'd say two hours talking to vendors and browsing boxes and tables and things and trying to figure out what to purchase and I had not yet had any luck. Um, so what I ended up deciding to do is taking a shot at negotiating with Angelo on one of his pieces which you will see in just a moment. That's not to say there were not untold gems at every booth. Let's take a look at one of my favorites from Bill's setup. So no matter who you are, I'm sure there was something for you to enjoy at this particular show. But anyways, the time had come to make my purchase. So for $20, I picked up Angelo's New Haven Lionel electric locomotive. I've seen these things called rectifiers or E33s or whatever they are. It doesn't matter. I think it's incredibly cool. He sold it to me non-running for $20. He originally wanted $60, but I was able to convince him to let go of it for $20. couple cool things about this engine. It utilizes an early band drive system by Lionel. 
Um, like I said, he sold it to me non-running. Um, all it's going to end up taking is uh, remating the drive shafts to each other with whatever flexible coupling is installed. Here I'm going to remove the shell so that you can see inside. As you can see, it's essentially direct driven from that belt to the worm gears. It's a really unusual and very interesting drive. In my opinion, it seems to be quite well constructed and we're going to see how well it holds up at a later date as I currently do not have the time to repair it. As of right now, the motor just kind of uh, free spins inside the drive shafts. It doesn't really go anywhere, but the lights do work and the motor seems to run healthily. So for $20, I'm really happy that I picked this guy up. It's a very unique and very interesting engine and hopefully you will see it zooming around on the layout very soon. One last really cool feature I wanted to share before we end the video is that the pantograph on top does pop up. And just wanted to show you guys that. So that's going to be it for my $20 train show video. I hope you guys enjoyed. Thank you so much for watching. Please rate, comment, and subscribe. And stay tuned for more interesting, unusual, and fun content here at Gopernopper's Trains.